नमस्ते आई वेलकम यू ऑल टू डमरु एंड आई एम वेरी हैप्पी एज वी कम टू येट एन अदर सेशन ऑफ आर एनुअल योगा फेस्टिवल बिलवा ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी टू आई एम माउली बावेस्कर फाउंडर एंड एग्जेक्टिव डायरेक्टर ऑफ डमरु योगा एंड साउंड थेरेपी स्टूडियो एवरी ईयर डमरु सेलिब्रेट्स बिलवा थ्रू आउट द मंथ ऑफ जुलाई एंड वी चूज डिफरेंट थीम्स मेनली रिलेटेड टू इंडियन योगी ट्रेडिशन एंड द नॉलेज सिस्टम्स and invite scholars from across the globe to share their knowledge with us last year as you know bilwa's theme was cultural appropriation of yoga and the necessity to embrace the inherent indianness of the yogic tradition this year the theme for bilwa is something like close to my heart as we celebrate the teachings of the great teacher and guru shri t krishna macharya and the holistic teachings in the kvm tradition as taught by t krishnamacharya's lifetime student and son shri tkv desikachar and there is a reason behind this why we are doing this um i feel very happy to share with you that damru is announcing a teacher training program in the kvm tradition in collaboration with krishnamacharya yoga mandiram and it is starting from this september so that's one more reason why we are celebrating this festival on the teachings of these great masters uh, t krishnamacharya and t k v desikachar sir and uh, before i proceed i should also introduce you about a little bit about this festival that we host every year so bilwa as we call it is conducted under the wing of damru foundation it is a Damru Foundation is a public charitable trust founded with the aim to promote the and implement traditional yogic sciences and increase awareness about wellness and harmony in that segment of society who are in dire need of help for their holistic wellness but may not be affording that so through our efforts we try to reach out to this population and uh, if you wish to support us in our efforts do consider contributing to damru foundation you can find the link to the payment options in the description box below and uh, know that your contributions will help us support more such people at the same time while this is happening parallelly your contributions also help us to bring across such valuable content and scholarly speakers from across the globe and share their knowledge with us about yoga and the traditional indian knowledge systems so with a brief introduction today i am very grateful to invite ms mrithya jagannathan to this forum so a very warm welcome ma'am namaste mrithya ji has been kind enough to grace the bilwa festival since its inception and we feel very proud and happy to host her and uh, she is like a strong support and now gladly we are also hosting this teacher training with full support from kvm especially from ritya ma'am i'll shortly briefly introduce her to the audience so with 20 years of teaching experience rather 23 now this is a So with 23 years of teaching experience Ms Ritya Jagannathan is currently the director of KYM Institute of Yoga Studies Krishnamacharya Yoga Mandiram Chennai India This is the training and certification wing of Krishnamacharya Yoga Mandiram She is also a senior yoga therapist from Krishnamacharya tradition and had the blessing of studying under the world renowned yoga master Shri TKV Desikachar She also is a senior faculty at the Department of Healing Chants teaching on yoga philosophy Vedic chanting Indian culture application of yoga and other allied subjects to the Indian and international students She has traveled extensively around the world to teach yoga and Vedic chanting and is a certified therapist from the International Association of Yoga Therapists She is a CIAYT She was part of KYM World Tour in 2005 that covered several cities across the world including uh, the cities in USA 
Nritya has traveled to and taught in uh, the UK, Germany, Sweden, Italy, Argentina, the USA, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Australia, Austria, sorry, France, and China. She has been a keynote speaker at the International Yoga Festival at Rishikesh for three consecutive years from 2015 to 2017. And it's also a part of the team that represents KYM at the Indochina Yoga Festival at China in October and November 2015. And again, in the Yoga Festival, which was in China in 2016. So she has led the International Yoga Day Protocol at Yoga in events organized by the Consulate Journal of India at Tonglu, Wenhao, Shanghai, and Wuxi in June 2017. A classical Bharatanatyam dancer as well, Nritya is passionate about Indian culture and yoga philosophy. She is also the editor-in-chief of Darshanam, the quarterly journal of yoga and yoga chikitsa in the Krishnamacharya Yoga Mandira. Nritya stays in Chennai with her family and uh, I am so privileged to have her again at Bilva. So ma'am, Again, a warm welcome. And every year, you talk about wonderful topics in depth, sharing your knowledge with us. And again, this time in relevance to uh, uncovering various facets of the Krishnamacharya tradition, uh, as our audiences are also aware of, we have been talking about different aspects of this tradition and how yoga is taught in the KYM. We have seen uh, some asana practices. We've studied the principles behind the asanas, also the pranayama practice. Uh, we Srinivasan sir also talked about the principles of yoga therapy as they are applied. But also what I wanted to uh, open the topic today uh, so, okay, before we start, just to introduce the audience, uh, the topic for today is uh, chanting and bhavana as a tool of yoga therapy. And while I say that, I would want ma'am to throw some light on that. That generally what we see as tools for yoga therapy would be asana, pranayama, meditations. What are the other tools? And like the topic said, if chanting is one of them, how does it come into play as a tool for yoga therapy? Thank you, Mauli. Very happy to be here with you again. I think this is our fourth consecutive year. And hopefully next year we can meet in person. <laughs> if all goes well. Let me, before I come to the topic that uh, you have asked me to speak about, let me start with an invocation and then I'll come to answering uh, your question. Yogena chittasya padena vacham malam sharirasya javaidya kena yopa karotam pravaram muninam patanjalim pranjali rana tosmi abah purushakaram shankha chakra sidharinam sahasra shirasam shvetam Pranama Mipatanjalim Srimate Anantaya Nagarajaya Namon Namaha Shri Krishna Vagi Shayati Shwarabhyam Samprap the Chakrankana Bhasha Saram Shri Nut Narangendra Yato Samarpitaswam Shri Krishna Mar Yanguru Varyami De Virodhe Kartike Mase Shatatara Krutodayam Yoga Charyam Krishna Maryam Guru Varyamaham Bhaje Krishna Suri Daya Patram Jnana Vairagya Bhushanam Shri Matvain Katanatharyam Vandeham Yoga Deshikam Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Om Bhadram Karne Bhishrunu Yama Deva Bhadram Pashyemaksha Bhirya Jatra 
ಸ್ವಸ್ತಿನೋಸ್ಪತಿರ್ದಾ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಟು ಕಮ್ ಟು ಯುವರ್ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ ಯೋಗ ಥೆರಪಿ ಅಪ್ಲಿಕೇಶನ್ಸ್ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ಅಸ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಬೀನ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕಸ್ಡ್ ಬೈ ಮೈ ಕೊಲೀಗ್ ಮಿಸ್ಟರ್ ಶ್ರೀನಿವಾಸನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಶೋರ್ ಬೈ ಸೆವೆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಅದರ್ ಸ್ಪೀಕರ್ಸ್ ಇಸ್ ವೆಲ್ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಸೀರೀಸ್ ಅಪ್ಲಿಕೇಶನ್ ಆಫ್ ಯೋಗ ಥೆರಪಿ ಫಂಡಮೆಂಟಲಿ ರಿಕ್ವೈರ್ಸ್ ಅಸ್ ಟು ಯೂಸ್ ದ the entire array of yoga tools to be applied in the context of an individual of an individual care seeker specifically with health related needs and see when we are speaking of health we we must understand that yoga therapy uh, as practiced in the tradition of krishnamacharya yoga mandiram is very closely allied to the yoga sutra of patanjali in terms of how it understands the mind the role that the mind plays on physical physiological psychological mental cognitive emotional spiritual wellness that becomes our substratum upon which we build and uh, the tools that are present in the yoga sutra themselves are many uh, most of the time when we speak of yoga or even yoga therapy unfortunately what is happening in many places across the world is a sort of a modified physiotherapy uh may be called by a different name but the yoga therapy approach while it might have certain parallels with a physiotherapy approach cannot be you cannot superimpose the two or you cannot uh, use physiotherapy techniques and call it yoga therapy that it comes from a different understanding and a different perspective of the various aspects that a a care seeker is affected by and that remains the hallmark of the krishnamacharya yoga mandiram till date from its inception in 1976 till date yoga therapy i must say is the mainstay and all the other all our other activities including our training programs are intended to support uh, the development of therapists uh, and so the teacher training becomes a base leading to the therapist training now when it comes to application of yoga tools most often we we are uh, we remain focused only on asana and then we look at okay what asana can i do for this problem but in the kym approach it is not what asana or what set of asanas or what protocol can i give for diabetes or what can i give for hypertension as sir desika char would always say it is who has this issue who is having diabetes it is not you are not treating the illness you are working with an individual with individual samskaras individual personal professional various other issues and therefore um we see that very often tools that might work for one may not work for another or even for the same condition you need a variety of tools and while asana is very well known we must remember that asana is not classically taught there is significant adaptation significant simplification where the therapists are trained to understand to observe very closely the form of an asana how the form can be adapted to bring in a certain function and that function can again one can tweak the function with the same posture bringing minor uh, shifts in attention to different parts of the body say for instance one might work with a twist and say your say a twist is a spinal twist so there is a twist in the in the region of the navel and yes naturally in the neck but even though your central function is a twist you can also work on peripheral limbs you can work on fingers if needed you can work on shoulders and so on so even asana application just diversifies into how many different ways you can adapt for that individual so also pranayama because pranayama i think pranayama in my opinion in the way we have all been taught and studied prana holds the key to yoga therapy interventions and when we understand that and we learn to work with prana as the living healing breath then so much can be done but in this context a tool that is i must say a very very important part of 
yoga therapy applications at the KYM, two major tools I must speak of are chanting and bhavana. For very many reasons, while see it is conventional in many cases that we don't see chanting as an integrated aspect of a yoga practice. Again, the reasons are many. For some, it might be religious reasons. And for others, simply because the idea of chanting as a separate activity. But in the vision of Sri Desikachar, we find that chanting becomes very often an anchor in a number of course plans. In fact, I must say about 60% of course design for individual care seekers at the KYM will involve some form of chanting or the other. Now, immediately this comes to the question, what chanting? And so while we have a base, given that we come, we have been, we have been taught by Sri Krishnamacharya's uh, uh, sir has taught us in the many of us are trained in Vedic chant as well with the sanction given by Sri Krishnamacharya. We are trained in the Krishna Yajurveda tradition. Now, while many of us have that background, for a care seeker who comes in to impart a difficult chant, sometimes the words are complex, understanding notation, understanding pitch, all of this is complex. And when they already have an issue to begin with, Unless there is an aptitude, what one teaches doesn't necessarily have to be mantra, but sound. Now, where sound can be used, how it can be used, there is a lot of one can adapt to the situation. Mantra can be used for those who are so inclined, who have the time, the willingness to learn, the capacity to comprehend the nuances and the pedagogy. Yes, chanting itself can be a standalone tool. But very often we can also, and this is again a very unique aspect of Krishnamacharya and the Desikachar approach, is to integrate. You take certain key elements from the mantra tradition, weave them into practices. And so it could be it could be an omkara, or it could be just be the use of ma, uh, or even just a single syllable sound like that. Or one could also piece together mantras such as Surya, Yanamaha, or Ram, Ram, Rama, Yanamaha, or Shanti, 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 any of these. Now, they can be woven into the asana practice along with the breath. See, now, as I said, breath, prana are the key. They hold the key to all manner of interventions. Now, why chanting? At a very fundamental level, when we look at, uh, you know, how chants work, uh, for those who are fairly familiar with sound production, specifically the idea of sacred sound, we are using the facial muscles, but sound itself originates from different parts, from the lower region of the throat to the palate, to the upper roof of the mouth, the teeth, the tongue, and how they interact. And... The science of Mantra Yoga tells us that every akshara, every syllable that is correctly articulated corresponds to specific uh, ending points of nadis. They, they definitely have an implication at a subtle anatomy level. And so simply articulating even the Sanskrita alphabet in itself can be a healing process. One that we have used for um, very often in cases with Children with special needs, children who have um, issues with, say, speech delay or articulation of certain sounds. One of the strategies, again, I'm not generalizing, but in certain cases, simply chanting the alphabet, the Sanskrita Aksharamala can be a very useful way to um, not only trigger speech, but then subtly it will also impact many aspects of the system. Alternately, the Maheshwara Sutras have been used by some of our teachers who work with children uh, with uh, different needs and capabilities. But So there is a physical component, but it's physical, physiological, but at a very subtle body level. But at a very practical level, when you look at exhalation, exhalation is the apana function. It is one of the essential, I would say vital functions for the maintenance of good health. In fact, it was Sir's opinion, Krishnamacharya's opinion that so much of illness is simply because of the inappropriate or improper, inadequate or um, impacted functioning of Apanavai. 
Now, apana, the exhale is essentially a function of exhalation, whereby when you breathe out, you are not just exhaling air. It is a process by which toxins are eliminated from the system, essential for life maintenance and um, rejuvenation, right? So the apana has to function well. Now, when do you chant? When you chant, you can only chant aloud on the exhale. Because it, it's simply impossible to chant and breathe in at the same time. But when you integrate chanting along with the breath, we find that it can remarkably extend the breath itself. The exhale can be extended and very useful in therapeutic situations where people breathe very short, shallow breaths. See, there are yogic texts that tell us that uh, on an average, we are breathing about 21,000. We, if we were to breathe 21,600 breaths in the course of a 24-hour span, then technically one has a lifespan of 100 years. This is our capacity provided we breathe well. But most of the time, we are not aware of the breath. We pay barely any attention. And not to mention the fact that stress, illness and various other constraints cause our breathing to become very short, heavy, shallow. And uh, most of the time, we're not even engaging our respiratory uh, muscles or the system. Now, when you use a simple sound or you just say breathe in and then ma, just chant as you breathe out. What we've noticed is that the length of the exhale can double or even triple in many cases. And this is, we have observed this repeatedly. Anyone can try it. You breathe in and out. Take a note of how long your breath is. Again, do the same thing. Breathe in and chant as you breathe out. Note the difference in time. And this is something that is a test that can be repeatedly validated. And we understand instantly that chanting serves the process of exhalation. Therefore, improving the apana functioning. Using that, one can also impact the quality of the inhalation. That is the beauty of chanting a very practical level that it enhances that exhalation function. From a cognitive perspective, chanting brings attention that when we are working with the tools of asana, asana, pranayama, tools of yoga, in many cases when we are working with our care seekers, we see that they might learn the technique fairly quickly in a couple of classes after which the movement tends to become mechanical. Mentally, they are somewhere else. And, uh, you know, natural uh, people are busy, they have their constraints at home, family, work, plus their own health issues. So we see that the mind often man wanders. They are continuing to do the movement, arms up on the inhale, down on the exhale, open on the inhale, close on the exhale. They will do all that. But nevertheless, the mind is not present at all. Now, chanting itself becomes an anchor to bring the mind to attention. And we find that the use of chanting. Uh, has this very significant uh, effect of improving cognitive function, making you very sharp, attention becomes better, concentrations, the duration for which you are able to concentrate becomes better and the retentivity also becomes better. The retentivity of information and other things. I think extremely important in these times where we are, uh, at least India and across the world, we are dealing with a geriatric population that is very, uh, uh, where, where we are seeing the early onset of dementia, early onset Alzheimer's, various other uh, issues where cognitive functions are severely impaired. And we find that chanting can be a good way that not only does it help with articulation and uh, stimulation of the subtle body, but also at this practical level in terms of uh, improving the cognitive capacity. And delaying any such uh, process of uh, cognitive decline because of the way you have to pay attention. You have to be present. Coming to the role of chanting at an emotional level, I think that chanting helps to bring some measure of balance, mood, mood stability, reduction of uh, irritability. That is the nature of the, uh, the chants, especially we are blessed with an abundance of uh, uh, mantras and uh, shlokas, totras, tutis. So much we have in our Shruti and Smriti tradition. One lifetime is not enough. But every one of them, uh, in many ways, I think, are already encoded because they are the 
either they are the revealed wisdom of these rishis who were capable because of their tapas because of their dhyana to resonate at a vibration that is not ours they they are seeing they have a vision of something that they have crystallized in that outpouring of the mantra or their lived experiences are birthed in the form of the smriti literature they are poignant they are pregnant they are rich with meaning and with intention the affirmations that are there in the mantra one doesn't need anything else when you do say abhadram karne bhi shruniyama devaha let my ears listen only to things that are auspicious let my eyes see what is auspicious swastina indro vriddha shravaha swastina pusha vishvavedaha swastina stakshyo arishta nemihi swastino brihaspate dadatu let all these gods let these forces give me wellness swasti is wellness total holistic wellness so you see that in the mantra in the chants are embedded these very powerful affirmations which itself can alter the mental state in fact i have had many students long term students not just of chanting even where we work with the chanting in therapy that more than the impact of the asana sometimes the chanting makes a difference in ways that you cannot you cannot even imagine unless you have used it that we use sometimes and sir's approach is very simple chants that are designed suiting the capacity of the practitioner suiting the mental states to suiting their aptitude interest the chant might be very simple but the outcome in terms of mood stability in term in terms of understanding or coping with a situation bringing patience we find that uh, over a period of time chanting becomes very potent and naturally also when you look at it from a spiritual perspective because our spiritual core is essential for our wellness and here i am reminded of uh, an anecdote narrated to all of us by shri desika char one that i think many students of desika char are familiar with that occurred during um, 9/11 2001 when sir happened to be in america uh, a little at a little distance away from the uh, world trade center uh, it was in the us uh, when the uh, when the planes crashed and the buildings came down immense loss of life immense immense tragedy of of uh, of an unprecedented proportion and he would, he told us that he was very disturbed and um, uh, just went to uh, the a park uh, and was just quietly sitting chanting he just closed his eyes he was chanting and uh, just trying to process you know the shock of this tragedy and generally sending forth an intention that that there is healing and you know for the lives that are lost as well and uh, he didn't know how long he had chanted when he opened his eyes there was a large crowd gathered all listening silently some with tears in their eyes but all of them were just they had just come there together seeking solace in the sounds they didn't know the meanings they didn't know any context because he was chanting from his heart the mantras that were closest to his heart and he said that it moved him greatly that people came together in such a situation and that they found solace in this and that is the power of mantra that it is an unseen power that you know we call it adrishta drishta phala you see you know you do something you move your hands you know people have some issues with back stiffness or disc bulge or orthopedic issues in the knees or uh, something like that and uh, it is uh, just one moment you mind it is that okay i will repeat this no it's beautiful it's, it's my good. mother I didn't realize we were recording that's so fine the... that's good <laughs> okay now and so um, i don't know where i stopped anyway but i will just continue that thread of thought mantra a lot of people were finding solace in that yeah. and how powerful a mantra could be yeah. and his experience of these people just gathered around seeking solace in each other's presence just listening to the mantra not knowing what it meant i think that was an experience that touched all of us because it was his lived experience and that is what we see also in our work with therapy 
that the mantra, the chant used can work in ways that an asana may or may not uh, contribute to. I'm not saying that other tools are not effective. Naturally, they are. See, you have uh, pain with the knees, you do an asana, and you, you see that flexibility improves, range of movement improves. Similarly, with neck pain, back pain, we've, we've found great um, effect working with, uh, say, hypertension or diabetes or ulceration, acidity, you whatever these issues are. But mantra works at a level that is not at a surface. And it is in Adrishta Phala. It takes a while for the effect of that mantra to actually start bearing a result and for the care seeker to see it. And that is the unseen power of chanting. Because in our tradition, sound is sacred. Vak is sacred. And so if we can make use of that potential for speech and you divert it to these these chants that are already there, they communicate everything that needs to be done, then as a composite approach to healing, I think it's most powerful, most potent. And in these times, especially, I think the world itself needs uh, these vibrations of these mantras, leave alone individuals, where we are seeking healing at this global level from uh, multiple issues, uh, multiple issues, great tragedies, I think mantra can be a very potent tool and we see this applied very simple, easy to access comprehensible ways in the therapist and in the, in the way we are integrating them into practices designed for yoga. So, uh, especially with the incident that you described about Sir's experience, we almost got, almost got goosebumps of how it would have been as while you were talking about mantra, introducing us to various aspects, woven within that, you told us so many benefits of mantras, actually at a physical, cognitive level, physical level, emotional level, and towards the end, we went into the Adrishta Phala and even the spiritual level. Um, maybe just for the ease of the audiences, one, if you could just summarize them, uh, for us, or, or uh, also uh, what I thought was that if this is so good and if it has come since thousands of years, why do we see a kind of resistance so when I am teaching? If I am teaching an asana, it's very easy for people to adapt it or even to accept it. But the moment we come to chanting, there is some form of resistance that comes about. Why do you think is that so? See, again, uh, what you're asking is a question, one that is, uh, I think, at the center of much controversy, especially in present times, one that I think we should all be aware of and address, that there is definitely an, a kind of a, an attempt made to um, isolate, you could say, or segregate practices of yoga or even Ayurveda, from, for that matter, from their traditional sanatana roots, there is no question that all these traditions, they are ancient traditions, they come to a common source. Even traditions of the Bauda and Jaina thought emerge in the same cultural ethos of the Vedic system. That is the background that cannot be disappeared. Unfortunately, this is becoming increasingly a trend and it is not a welcome trend. Because unless one understands and anchors yoga, Ayurveda, and various other traditions in Vedic thought, in Sanatana Samskriti, in that cultural ethos of the Bharatiya people collectively, then uh, I think we are doing it a big disservice. And so while people are very comfortable with the idea of, you know, saying, um, oh, I practice Buddhist meditation. Where is Buddhist meditation coming from? What are its sources? All these trace their origins to some beautiful models of Upasana that you find in the Upanishads. The yogic tradition is a Vaidika Darshana. Ayurveda is one of the Upavedas. So there is no question of disappearing it. But then this is where people start getting uncomfortable. And they say that, oh, then it goes against my religion. But also this is where I think Desikachar's contributions are significant. Because again, Shri Krishnamacharya as well. That for those who are so inclined, who have that belief, then 
we always ask and say, what is your Ishta Devata? Who is your Kula Devata? Or who is your Guru? Or who is that deity or entity with whom you find a strong connect that makes you feel uh, positive, makes you feel rejuvenated. And either you take an existing mantra based on that or stotra or that deity with a namaha. See, for instance, there might be people who say, I worship Sai Baba. And so, Om Sai Natha Yanamaha. Because you're creating a connect. It becomes a bridge to that deity. And you're able to draw that into their practice. That gives meaning to the practice. But I have, we have all seen Sir not restraining himself to the Vaidik Mantra for those who, who want to stay away. Because this is again Sir's vision. That the benefits of yoga must access everybody, must reach everyone. And that is very important. And so he has designed practices with simple chants in English, in Spanish, uh, uh, chants or even small song-like creations um, for those who have a faith in Mary or in Jesus or in Allah or in the Buddha or uh, in, in any tradition, whatever be it, or even to negotiate and to um, uh, design chants from the culture itself that may or may not have a um, a religious bias in case the care seeker is hesitant. But I think this is an issue that should be addressed because as uh, Sir and uh, Sri Krishnamacharya always were of the opinion that the only prerequisite one needs to practice yoga, including its multiple tools, is that you're alive. You need your body. You need to be breathing. And these are tools. Uh, and This is also why uh, I don't know how many people know this. Sir is very well known for his book, The Heart of Yoga which is actually formally, it was published as religiousness in yoga to make a point that you don't have to follow any religion per se to follow yoga. At the same time, you cannot deny the fact that yoga has Vedic roots, but it is essential, imperative to be religious in your practice of yoga. You bring that commitment, that shraddha, that unswerving commitment to the practice. Because it is a sadhana, whether it is a sadhana for your wellness, for your physical, mental, emotional wellness, or whether yoga is seen as a sadhana for something higher, that depends on the bhumi or the level of the student. But the fact remains that you bring that kind of single-minded devotion and attention into the practice. And therefore, in the tradition of the KYM, there are ways and means of adapting chants, sounds to suit the interest of those who are practicing. And I... And I think all our teachers will agree that this should not be a deterrent in any way. At the same time, it is also important and because this is a platform where I believe this must be said that you cannot disappear these roots. That the roots are essential. It is important to honor them. It is important to recognize them. It is important to acknowledge those roots and celebrate them as they are. So, uh... Like you said about chanting and adapting as per the preferences or beliefs, uh, we did one session with uh, Dr. Lata Satish and Dr. Helfried Krishet. He uh, does uh, chanting in the Kivayam tradition through the Vedic uh, sources. He also does the Gregorian chants and the Latin ones. And it's a wonderful mix that he comes about. So actually, when you said this resistance in terms of religious preferences, at a level somewhere, I can still understand that, okay, but the sad part is that even those who belong to the Sanatana Dharma or culture, maybe because it is so deep rooted, they don't even, are, they're not even aware of these factors. And yet there is a resistance somewhere deep down. And uh, that's the sad part. That is, a, that is a needless fear. I think that uh, it is in the hands of a, of a competent therapist to understand and guide. See, the point is that you don't have to impose chanting on everyone. There has to be a willingness because otherwise no tool will work. But at the same time, you have to move them towards that openness. Because very often another problem I will say is also we suppress so much. We literally suppress our, uh, our distress so much in so many ways that we are not able to speak what we have made unspeakable within us. Chanting will give an outlet. This we have seen in many cases that 
much that is suppressed much that is just shoved under the carpet because of great trauma because of incapacity to deal with it will just come forth when you start using chanting it breaks a lot of barriers that could also be a reason for the fear that you know literally we've lost our voice in every sense of the word because of various uh, personal uh, issues stresses trauma that could be another reason for the resistance that i have seen in students where they hesitate and they say what will someone think of me if i use this or um, will i be disturbing someone you know who's maybe you know you live with a family a spouse children elders maybe i'm disturbing them or or i have a very bad voice and so you know maybe that will be a disturbance so there's so much of hesitation that incapacity somewhere not able to open up and i think chanting gives us that it opens us not just the vocal cords i think it does as sir says he says it so beautifully he says chanting opens our hearts that some remarkable transformation happens at an anandamaya level and then it's like floodgates opening very many other things will start falling in place just like that and uh, there is a process of uh, opening up of of inquiry of reflection that is enabled through that but for that you have to allow yourself to do it because very often we are afraid of you know facing these demons or the various issues that will come up you're not ready and this fear of being judged and so one prefers not to speak one prefers to suppress and i think those are other issues not just religious it is also this deep emotional incapacity to just open up and to uh, to share for because of society pressure from the family fear of judgment i know so many of us male female children we just suppress 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 and then that manifests as vyadi in some form so i think, I think this is very that, very true so we've seen this not once or twice but time yes. and again with chanting sessions so many times it is followed up by a cathartic kind of expression yes. and uh, yeah you are to the point exactly so uh, while we also talk about chanting uh, and like you said that if you get used to a practice it becomes very technical by itself it yeah. just happens so there is another aspect along with chanting that um, we use which is the bhavana so how do you integrate that and what role does bhavana as well play okay see um i would say bhavana is embedded in the mantra in the chanting itself for the most part because they are as i said they are pregnant they are filled with meaning if you can only comprehend them but in the context of therapy see very often we are dealing with people who are ill there is a lot of pain there is suffering in the case of certain sometimes terminal conditions or with chronic conditions long term uh, you know they are suffering so the morale is very low fear is very high what will happen to me fear becomes a major factor in fact we have so many care seekers so who say they are afraid and so constantly going to doctors doing tests worrying about test results but in a sense this all of these only serve to um at uh, accelerate accelerate this daurmanasya you know that uh, yoga sutra says dukha daurmanasya angame jayatva shwasa prashwasa vikshepa sahabuva daurmanasya we are always feeding the negative what if this happens what if that test result is you know bad um you know i'm sick what if i don't get better what if i have more pain or what if someone in my family falls ill this is again a recurrent idea that sometimes we have people in fact recently i had a care seeker who might did the consultation for who lost a parent to cancer but her greatest fear is what if the other parent dies and uh, so see the the thing is we are feeding that and our thoughts have power they have potency because it is this that you are sending forth and where bhavana comes along with the mantra is to alter that sir would always tell us prabalena durbalasya badaha there is this strong negative samskara that is depleting that is pulling you down that is leading you increasingly towards that negativity as is your thought that is the action yato bhava tata bhavati what is in your mind that is what will manifest instead can you alter can you change the track can you divert 
Can you do something else or you plant a new samskara that will compensate or sometimes even outweigh that force of negativity? That is the power of mantra. That is the power of bhavana. And so bhavana is about bringing positive affirmation, a visualization of health, of wellness, of healing, of peace, tranquility, which is already there in the mantra. Or these are what we want in our prayers, you know, typically at the highest level. When there is that clarity, there's nothing to pray for. You just surrender and uh, it's Ishwara's, Ishwara will take care. You just, Pranidana is all that is needed. But then when we suffer, it's very hard. For, for the most of us, there are questions of why me? Why is this happening to me? Why only me? And there is that physical incapacity, pain. The, the diversion that Bhavana gives is that it takes you away from that. In your mind, you try to visualize another outcome. Again, that is where we are feeding into the power of the mind. Just as the Vyuttana Samskara, the, the negative patterns or these patterns of agitation, when they take root, they will impact the whole system. The same can happen with Nirodha Samskara. That is what we are trying to do with both Mantra and Bhavana. That you create a strong, positive, affirmative pattern for the mind, which will over or overpower or outweigh the impact of this negativity. So yes, you can look at it as diversion. But I think it's more important to look at Bhavana as a tool that promotes positive thought, positive visualization, positive intention. Because what we seek is essentially the same thing. So you could say, just as an example, you could say that, uh, you know, I hope I don't fall ill. I hope I don't catch COVID-19. Because that's our biggest fear, right? In the last two years, we've uh, I think we've uh, given way to a fear economy. What if, what if I catch COVID? What if the, my neighbor has COVID? What if we were to transfer that into, let me be well. Let me be well. Let me be healthy. Let my neighbors be healthy. Let my family be healthy. May the world around me be healthy. It is the same intention. The intention is seeking wellness. But one has a negative implication and the other is positive and affirmative. That is the power of bhavana. Now, when you can, you, there can be bhavana without mantra. But the mantra itself becomes very... Um, very easily it enables the bhavana if you can explain what it means and so when you weave mantra and bhavana any chant for that matter it doesn't have to be vedic in origin chanting and bhavana together to that extent it it uh, increases the potency the efficacy of the practice and at least for a brief period a brief window there is a diversion from that preoccupation with illness with fear with suffering with anguish brief windows of shift Little by little, those windows can be expanded because those are windows of prana, of positive prana, of healing energy that can be extended over a period of time and over, over much time that can become the new normal. We don't have to become uh, victims of our health or the things that our mind, because the mind is very tricky. It can lead you very rapidly into a declining spiral. All it needs is one thought. What if? Something happens, this happens, that happens, something negative. Technically, anything can happen any any time. See, that is our reality. That is what our Sanatana system also tells us that at any point, anything can happen. Be prepared, just align. That is Ishwara Pranidhana. But Mantra and Bhavana enable that in a, in a very practical way. You are able to just be present, do what you have to do, bring that visualization and then let go. So I, I think, think that really helps. helps. Technically also, there are a lot of people, maybe not afraid of the physical illnesses, but they are so much into that negative loop. They're almost yes. trapped in that. And even if we want them to visualize something positive, they'll think that, oh, this is just fake. The reality is yeah. this only. So that's where I feel that those are really trapped there. The mantra, like you said, small window, baby steps, but it gets them out gradually out of that. Briefly, see, the, the power behind the mantra is that whether or not you visualize it, the potency is already embedded. Uh, in fact, uh, Dr. David Frawley, in one of his articles for us, for the Dashanam, he wrote about Shanti. And he said, you can try saying peace, 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 peace in English. You say it, it's okay. And yes, there is a certain quality associated with, yes, you might feel a sense of calm. But that is not comparable to saying Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. 
that the very articulation of those sounds has within it that quality of calming, of tranquilization, of pacification, a sense of um, harmony, of things quietening that the word translated cannot do. And that is the gift that I think Bharatavasha has given to us that if we were to use it can be very, very powerful as a tool. So, okay. Now another thing, application of this tool that when we generally say yoga, it is categorized as asana, then pranayama, then meditation, chanting as a standalone tool. How do we integrate all of them? Like, is it possible to see them as one or a practice which is designed as one? Where asana, pranayama, meditation, chanting, it's all one. It's not parts. Yes, certainly. That is how it is taught here. While, see, some people might want a standalone practice of mantra uh, based on their aptitude or interest. There are those kind of care seekers as well where we might select certain mantras, teach them. That is a separate practice. It is a sadhana. But when I'm speaking of integration, it is integrating into the movement, into the breath. So you can integrate the chanting with the asana. As you see, for instance, you do a tadasana, inhale, you go up, or you raise your toes, you raise your arms up and then Om Shanti. You can exhale, bring the hands down. If you are chanting aloud, then you'll chant on the exhale. Or alternately, you can inhale and exhale, but you do the chanting in your mind. So that can be done in any asana. Similarly, pranayama. Again, it can be outside. It can be loud. Uh, because it, chanting is only a function of exhale. And so you see that you can use chanting aloud for pranayama. Or you do a mental chant with any technique. In fact, Nadi Shuddhi with the Dayatri Mantra is one of the most potent forms of pranayama. It is referred to as Sagarbha Pranayama because it births that uh, life that is contained in the mantra is literally birthed through the vehicle of uh, prana. So that can be done. Bhavana can be used in the practice as well. Um, see, for instance, um, say someone, again, I'm just giving you an example. We often think of, think of postures only from a physical, physiological perspective. Say a Veerabhadrasana. You say it's a back arch. What does a back arch do? It uh, lengthens the spine. It opens the thoracic region. So you are strengthening the back, opening the chest. Yes. What is it doing at a deeper emotional level? You find that the back arches are very powerful postures to bring about a sense of confidence, of facing up to challenge, to open up. Generally, when people, over time, you know, when we when there is a lot of sadness, sorrow, distress, there is a tightness in the region of the chest. And even physically, you will see that there's a rounding. The, there could be a rounding here. The shoulders round. The, the This is coming inward. And so literally, this upper chest region is like rock. There's no movement. And there is a rounding. There is a hunching. Now, as you open, you can visualize. You can visualize... Uh, see the different ways of integrating. You can work with the principle of wind itself. And so you can use uh, Vaya Vena Maha. And just visualize that openness because the chest is the seat of prana. So the visualization can be simply one of opening, of expanding. Or as you inhale, uh, for those who are cap ca uh, able to do this again, because again, visualization is not easy. But one that I've used very effectively is to visualize a lotus or any flower as a bud in the region of the chest. And as you inhale, it opens out a little bit. And then you exhale. And then inhale, again, you open up. You As your arms open up, you visualize that you're giving more space for that bud to blossom until you've brought it to its full capacity. So that can be integrated, say, into a Veerabhadrasana. This is just an idea that, I mean, uh, a lot of this is innovation. There are no protocols. Um, even with asana, you can say, okay, this is a technique, classical technique. This is how you do it with pranayama. When it comes to bhavana, I think a lot of it is intuitive. And when the therapist is rooted in a sadhana, then it is possible to visualize and to come up with different ways of integrating that visualization element into the posture. So uh, I would say, yes, essential that while one can do it as a standalone pra uh, pra practice, uh, when it comes to therapy, you'll find that the potency of the other tools, whether it's asana or pranayama, will become multifold when you layer them with 
uh, chanting and with bhavan. So that can be done throughout the practice. Beautifully integrated, no? <laughs> so, uh, maybe now I'm just proposing it on the session. But what you said, maybe we could do some other day a little workshop or a practice session where you lead us into these integrative practices. And uh, we could do that. Certainly. That's a request. <laughs> Absolutely. I'd be happy to do it. Uh, because it feels so beautiful. When you say this tightness, we see it in so many people, especially who come with, I don't know if it is right or wrong, but I've seen that those who come with autoimmune conditions, especially them, they have this kind of hardness about this area, not not only physical, but you can sense it. So yes. for them to open up is almost like a little difficult to lead them into that softness of opening. Another thing, as you told, and it struck me is that it's almost intuitive or innovation is also called in for, which means in this tradition, if we have that much of freedom to explore and pick, then that much of uh, Viveka Buddhi is also required. And that also explains why uh, the trainings of KYM are so in depth. Because yes. unless the therapist or the teacher is rooted in a fairly uh, sattvic kind of a samskara, I can say, or maybe at least available to use positive innovative yes. interpretations, it could also lead to opposite results. Yeah, so, see, this is very important that in the name of therapy, in the name of application, we don't have the adhikara to, you know, just uh, alter chants as you wish or alter the function. There, there are mantras that sanctity is untouched. You cannot do anything to the mantra. You take the Gayatri mantra, you cannot tamper with it in any way. You take the Mrityunjaya mantra, you, we do not have the adhikara to touch it. That goes for all the Vedic mantras. It also holds for the other stuti, stotras and so on, that we have no adhikara to misinterpret. Which is why I would say that if one is adapting, applying these tools of mantra and bhavana, the reason, see, when I say bhavana, then yes, there are positive affirmations. You can just say, you know, um, uh, affirmation like, I am good, I am worthy, I am beautiful. You look in a mirror and you look at every part of your body as you practice breathe in, breathe out look at the part of the body and just say thank you. This can be a general neutral interpretation for someone maybe who has a very poor body image. In fact, I've used practices like this of affirmation where, but I used a mantra. I basically said, uh, aham annam. I used aham annam. Uh, I am this body nourished by food. Uh, and I asked this uh, student to touch every part of the body and say thank you. Doing the chant, touch the body, say thank you in the mind. Say, thank you for functioning as you are. I love you. Or I, I accept this part of my body as it is. So you can go neutrally that way. That is also possible. But when we are using a mantra, when you are using a sacred chant, then you have to know the meaning. There's no question of um, playing around with this or taking chances. because. And again, this is something that unfortunately is happening a lot with Bija mantras. Now, Bija mantras are... They are very sacred, also very, very profound teachings. They are not to be randomly disseminated uh, to anybody, anytime in a group situation. In fact, there are many mantras that, that is why they are called guhya. They are held in secrecy because they have to be given only in the right way to the eligible sadhaka. Now, one has to be very cautious in terms of how we are using mantras because can I use anything as I feel like? Certainly not. We don't have the adhikara. What you have the adhikara for, you can use or simple adaptations. That is That was Sir's forte. That where necessary, he might have given a bhavana with say Sudarshana or Hayagriva or Narasimha, but with great care. Because you also have to factor in the other niyamas around that practice that the sadhana of such a devata requires. But it is also the same Desika Char who uh, came up with simple, uh, you know, mantra segments such as uh, Shalom Jesus, um, Shalom, and then um, uh, Shalom, not Jesus, just Shalom became a chant that was used for a student. 
and then senor jesus just uh, for a spanish student just addressing that deity of choice or um, also you can work with uh, you know say vaya ve namaha or bhum yai namaha simple salutation salutations to the earth element or salutations to the wind element adhyo namaha salutations to the water so you can work you can create simple uh, chants neutral chants that are i would say suitable for everyone anyone any time to use but when it comes to um, mantras very uh, very profound teachings bijaksharas then you have to be very careful you can't misinterpret unfortunately a lot of this is also happening with uh, growing interest say in the chakras and then therefore the bijas of that chakra i believe that 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 needs a certain process of purification the yamas niyamas all that is also essential otherwise one can it can lead to other outcomes we have to be very cautious in terms of how we choose and so i think that discernment what should i use what is not appropriate also we must remember what a i might do or a therapist might do as a personal sadhana that has been instructed by a guru that may not be suitable for everyone that is given to that person but when you are rooted in that sadhana it will give you that ability to intuit what might be developed for the other but you can't directly copy and give that is again a problem that we have this in a sense this photocopying of practices that are designed for an individual with a set of needs and then just randomly administered that can be very dangerous and not advisable at all yeah so if we don't know the meaning if you don't know the power behind the mantra my uh, strongest recommendation would be don't you need the adhikara you need the training to do it precisely that's why i brought this up because this happens a lot because we are working with something which is extremely powerful yes and so we need to be trained to be using that in a positive manner yes so yeah i think we covered a lot of a range of things related to chanting and bhavana uh like you said one yeah, of the practices if i may say this just one thing before you go on that in fact um, sir has told us this of a student who um without his uh, he hadn't approved or it wasn't discussed but uh, just started off her own practice of uh, focusing on the sudarshana now as a devata sudarshana is very potent very powerful and is visualized as fire and she started based on someone's advice went into this practice and then after a point was unable to sleep because her dreams were just full of fire all the time fire being consumed by fire she is running fire coming behind her and then he discussed it when she came for a consultation and then they realized that this that she had been doing this practice without the appropriate preparation and so on and then uh, he has narrated that he had asked her to alter the bhavana for her that that was not the right bhavana without the right due process uh, so just as an example that sometimes these choices which is why you have to learn from a teacher mantra and bhavana cannot be randomly administered or um, you know that this is not something that can become a part of a course they are born of sadhana that and so you might have a certificate that says that you might be proficient in chanting not enough you have to have a sadhana that will help you to this is what sir would say you do your samyama when you have your personal practice then that instinct that intuition that okay this can be used this can be adapted but that comes with experience and very cautiously done that you don't even an agni bijam you can say okay i want to work on fire but you can't just use ram 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 it can be dangerous you have to understand the uh, the potency of that sound and the implications it will have before you use it for whom you are using it what context what is the outcome that you desire i think all this becomes paramount before we design and teach practices using mantra and bhav so that word of caution is i think something very important in today's day where randomly we can just google up a mantra and then share it with uh, saying that okay you do this you do that that could be a disaster actually very dangerous so 
if we could close the session today with a very short uh, practice of maybe nyasam with some chanting or bhavana or certainly, maybe certainly. you can certainly certainly i will lead you through it i won't take too much time um, yeah, yeah, I short think, uh, what i'll do is um, i'll work with just shanti 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 hi this is what we need i think collectively we are at a point where wherever you turn people are in a state of stress i don't think we even realize that um, you know that we are in this heightened uh, state of um, uh, sympathetic nervous activity almost all the time there is this uncertainty there is this sense of not being settled not knowing what's happening you look at the travel situation in europe uh, prevailing now you look at the situation in sri lanka so many parts of the world uh, with the war happening in um, eastern europe and wherever you see on the other hand you have issues with regard to climate change and flash floods and uh, forest fires unprecedented floods in the i think in uh, one of the national parks in america where the entire uh, park had to be i think um, uh, yellowstone had to be closed down because of unprecedented flooding so i think at a deep level there is a sense of disharmony uh environmentally individually collectively so we will work with shanti 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 hi that the word shanti very beautiful the word uh, shanti indicates very loosely we are saying peace but it is essentially shamanam it is pacification tranquility a return to seri serenity harmony where we resonate in synchronicity with all these beings around us so that there is inner and outer uh, balance and come let's see that is what we need over and above everything for a process of healing one has to first calm down that 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 sympathetic nervous action has to come down the parasympathetic nervous function has to be strengthened chanting long exhalation will automatically contribute more so when you bring in a bhavana of shanti so we will use this um uh, i'd like you to just sit comfortably those who are watching who are following this you can take a comfortable seated position uh, you can use this in um, asanas as well but for the purpose of this session we want i want i'm not going to make you stand up or move around we'll just do the seated so just sit with your back straight eyes closed keep your chin slightly lowered take a few breaths settle the mind now i will chant as you inhale when i chant please breathe in repeat the chant as you breathe out i'm just going to be working with variants of shanti he will keep the length of your breath will keep changing i'm going to increase the length of your breath to the maximum so just listen as i chant inhale repeat the chant as you exhale breathe in shanti hi shanti hi inhale shanti hi shanti hi inhale shanti hi shanti hi inhale shanti shanti hi shanti shanti hi inhale shanti shanti hi 
शांत शांति इन्हें शांति शांति शांत शांति इन्हें शांति शांति शांत शांति इन्हें शांत शांत शांति शांत 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 शांत शांति इन्हें ओम शांत शांत शांति ओ शांत शांत शांति इन्हें ओ शांति की शांत शांत शांति इन्हें ओ Take a few breaths. There is an essential harmony that is always around us in nature. whether it is the plant world or the animal world there is a harmony there is a synchronicity which is essentially of the quality of shanti it's there in the trees it's there everywhere in the winds that blow the ocean waves so as you just close your eyes i'd like you to visualize that just for a minute or so that quality of serenity of harmony that is innately present in nature and then as you inhale i'd like you to visualize that quality moving into you flowing into you through the breath and then we'll chant on your exhale just take a minute to visualize this quality what this shanti means to you
it could be any image it could be something to do with the trees it could be a ocean side it could be a lake it could be just that quality of serenity that is abundant around us just visualize it and then draw it in as you breathe in as you breathe out you chant shantihi so i will chant as you breathe in you will chant as you breathe out along with this we will do the anganyasam where you focus on the different parts that i tell you the navel chest throat forehead top of the head so when you focus on the navel just visualize inhale drawing in this quality of shanti to your heart and then chant shantihi and just visualize that quality spreading around the region of your navel and the lower limbs then we move on to the next part i hope my instructions are clear so you're doing multiple things you are doing your breathing in and out at the same time you're holding a visual of this quality of calmness serenity tranquility just flowing in as you breathe and then as you chant you just visualize that quality spread throughout the body from the navel down then in the region of the chest in the region of the throat in the region of the forehead and then at the top of the head okay so just place your fingers on your navel close your eyes couple of moments to just visualize this abundance of calmness around us i will chant as you breathe in draw this shanti within hold it as you exhale chant and visualize it spread through the body palm fingers on your knee inhale shanti 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 now place your palms on your chest same visualization breathing shanti 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 ki shanti 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 fingers on the region of the throat inhale shanti 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 ki shanti 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 fingers on the forehead shanti 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 hi shanti 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 hi on the top of your head shanti 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 ki shanti 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 now again from the navel this time we will chant softly the same visualization inhale shanti 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 hi shanti 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 hi fingers on the chest breathe in draw this quality of shanti within shanti 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 ki shanti 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 ki on the throat inhale shanti 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 
शांत 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 फोरहेड इनहेल शांत 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 टॉप ऑफ द हेड इनहेल शांत 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 वन लास्ट राउंड नाउ यू चांट मेंटली इनहेल विजुअलाइज शांति फ्लोइंग इन दैट quality of shanti flowing in hold it in your heart in your mind chant as you breathe out chant in silence again palms on the navel chest throat forehead top of the head i will not give you instructions i will wait for you to finish now as you finish just visualize a sphere surrounding you a circle of protection just made up of this mantra just chanting om shanti hi om shanti shanti hi om shanti 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 hi this is what you will do you will raise your arms up above your head as you inhale and then om shanti the he just draw a circle around you bring your fingers back to your heart again inhale i will chant and then another circle broader and the third time largest circle so three concentric circles you are held inside inhale i will chant as you draw the arms around in a circle back to your heart you chant right you can start with the fingers folded together either at the heart or in the anjali mudra both are okay inhale Om Shanti Hi. Chant. Draw a circle around. Om Shanti Hi. Inhale. Om Shanti Shanti Hi. Om Shanti Shanti Inhale Om Shanti 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 Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. 
to just for a minute visualize being very comfortably held within these circles of protection the circles of nurture of shanti as i chant i will be chanting one of the shanti mantras seeking both this shanti inside and outside for the universe at large where i pause after every line please chant om shanti 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 just feel that you're held within these circles of great serenity tranquility and heart om prithvi shanta sagnina shanta sami shanta shujadum shamayatu om shanti 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 antariksha gum shantan tad vayuna shantan tanme shanta gum shucha gum shamayatu om shanti 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 dhyao shanta sadityena shanta sami shanta shuchagum shamayatu om shanti 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 Tayahagum shantya sarva shantya Mahyan dvipade cha tushpade cha Shantim karomi shantir me astu shantihi Om shanti 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 keep your palms down take a few breaths in silence offer your gratitude to the universe at large to ishwara to the light within for holding you for nourishing you open your eyes whenever you are ready thank you i also realize there are levels of shanti so when yes. we started off without the nyasam i was just chanting after you i could feel the facial muscles softening the rest of the body relaxing then when we started with nyasam it was a different level of shanti and then when we were making that whole shield around us the shanti was almost empowering yeah it was shanti but very powerful in some way which is why i said the the mantra has it in it we don't have to do anything we just have to resonate at that same uh, frequency of that mantra to be able to experience it. thank you thank you for sharing the practice thank you for You're sharing the session with us mm. after this not much is coming to my mind but yes <laughs> grateful for you to share the space with us thank you so much thank you mauli and, and thank you for having me here and also for this very beautifully curated uh, festival dilwa this year we've had some very beautiful sessions very in depth uh, amazing sessions actually especially if you 
uh, people who are viewing us, if you are into teaching yoga or related to yogic practices, doing your sadhana, do go through the sessions. Not because it is a festival that I am hosting, but genuinely all the sessions are really, really enlightening. So please have a look at my YouTube channel. You'll find them. So with that, we will close the session today and we will come, as you know, with yet another session tomorrow morning. So see you then. Namaste. Namaste. A very warm welcome. Today, uh, we are very, very excited to announce teacher training program at Damru. This teacher training is happening at Damru in collaboration with Krishnamacharya Yoga Mandiram. So I'm so happy to invite Ms. Nritya Jagannathan. She is the director of KYM Institute of Yoga Studies. And I just hand over to her because she's the best person to explain you what exactly we are getting into. Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha, Namaskara. On this occasion of Damaru's anniversary, it gives me great joy to announce on behalf of the KYM the upcoming Yoga Teacher Training Certificate Program offered by the Krishnamacharya Yoga Mandiram in collaboration with Damaru Studios Ahmedabad. This is the first time that's, that this very intensive teacher training course comes to the western part of India at Ahmedabad. As many of you may be well aware, the Krishnamacharya Yoga Mandiram is a world-renowned center founded by Sri Tikevi Deskacha in 1976 as a tribute to his father, teacher and legendary yogi Sri Krishnamacharya. Founded as primarily a center for yoga therapy, over the years, the KYM also has acquired very solid reputation for its training programs, both in yoga studies as also healing chants, as these are fundamental even to the process of application of yoga tools. In this context, Krishnamacharya Yoga Mandiram and Damaru come together to offer you this 800-hour yoga teacher training program. 800 hours is inclusive of both the classroom and non-classroom hours, including personal study, project preparations, assignments, observation, internship, and so on. This program follows a syllabus that has been designed by the Academic Council of KY, following very closely the guidelines laid down by Sri Tikevides Kacha when he first conceived this program. The syllabus includes a very deep study of the classical techniques of asana, classical techniques of pranayama, the theory of asana, the fundamental theoretical principles of asana, modifications of asanas to suit people of different capabilities, theory and practice of dhyana, apart from which there is also certain associated study, such as the history and evolution of yoga, a deep study of the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali, covering all four chapters of the text, an exposure to other yoga literature, such as the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, the Bhagavad Gita, the Yoga Rahasya, and the Yoga Yagnya Valkya Samhita. Apart from this, students will go through a study in certain allied subjects in every module of the training, fundamentals of anatomy and physiology, fundamentals of Ayurveda, and also an introduction to psychology. Apart from this, chanting of the Yoga Sutra will also be an integral part of the study modules. Now, this course requires 
uh, unlike many other short term courses is designed to run for a period of about 18 months in the hybrid mode a big part of the learning will happen with teachers from the KYM teaching in person at Damru Studio Ahmedabad with a portion of the subjects also being conducted online. Through the process of every module of training, there will be ongoing assessments, evaluations, discussions and so on, culminating in a graduation where you will be certified, those who graduate will be certified as yoga teachers in the tradition of the Krishnamacharya Yoga Mandiram. The Krishnamacharya Yoga Mandiram is one of the leading yoga institutes of India, recognized by the Yoga Certification Board under the Ministry of Ayush. And this level of training, this 800 hour teacher training course will prepare students to be able to take the level three exam of the yoga certification board. Also, this program is eligible to be recognized under the 500 hour advanced certificate program of the Indian Yoga Association as well. And with these words, I would like to invite those of you who are interested in a deep, serious study of yoga philosophy, yoga psychology, its practice and its application from a very reputed tradition, one that has that has is known the world over, to go through this process, which not only helps you to qualify yourself as a as a yoga teacher, as a teacher of yoga from a very reputed tradition, it can also offer much uh, by way of reflective uh, food for thought, offering a way to reflect on, to understand various life processes, to understand how the mind works. And through this understanding, to integrate the philosophy into our living, so to effect uh, an overall transformation in our lives itself. And here I speak for so many hundreds of students, both Indian and international, who have gone through this training and who have benefited greatly from the value that this program can bring to you both professionally and personally. For further details, please do reach out to Mauli Babiskar, who will be coordinating with us in running the course at Damru. And, uh, with these words, I take your leave and we look forward to having a very good uh, registration for this program that the KYM is offering for the very first time at Ahmedabad. Thank you so much. Namaskar. Thank you, ma'am. Gujarat welcomes the Krishnavatarya Yoga Mandiram. The privilege is ours. A very ancient parampara is coming to this part of India. And I urge all of you to take advantage of that, to get into an in-depth exploration of the yogic studies. All our contact details are there in the description box. D-A-M-A-R-U, www.damaru.in is our website. Realm of Damaru is our handle on Facebook, Instagram, and you will get all the details. So do reach out and register because Another aspect of uh, this tradition is that we do not take trainings or trainees in large numbers. So there's a very limited amount of seats that we are offering for this training so that we could get deeply involved. So get in touch and see you on the other side. Thank you.